This is On Base, your one-stop shop for solving your most pressing B2B go-to-market challenges. Each week, hosts Chris Moody and Paul Gibson talk to sales and marketing leaders to get you in-depth insights and creative strategies to set your revenue teams up for success. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to On Base. I'm your host, Chris Moody. And today, I'm really excited to be joined by Mana Ionescu on Marketing with Mindfulness. Mana, I know you have an incredible background for our listeners. If you could tell everyone a little bit about yourself. Yeah, hi. I'm so happy to be here. I lead the digital marketing practice at Exos Bank. And prior to that, I led my own agency uh, for almost 13 years. I am very, very fascinated with how we use data to make decisions and with today's topic, AI and marketing. Awesome. We talked about this extensively when we met before, and it was really educational for me. I took great notes. And one of the things that we talked about was balancing the speed and accuracy benefits of AI, but making sure that you have ethical and unbiased decision making. So if that's something that we should all be focused on, could you tell us a little bit about how we do that? It's important to implement a few key and fundamental practices. Obviously, everybody knows about the diverse data sets, and you'll hear Data scientists talk a lot about how the outcome is, the output is only as good as the data, how clean the data is, how good the data is, but also how wide and diverse and representative it is of all demographics so that we minimize bias. The other important practice is regular audits. So we don't, we don't want to do that, right? We, we want to set it and forget it and then move very fast because we want to make those dollars that ideally these predictions or the output of our algorithms or our models can help us with. We want to move very fast to making money. But I believe that there's a, a set of governance uh, models or frameworks that we need to put in place so that we can do this well. And regular audits is one of those. And don't worry, marketers, you don't have to look at the code. There's Your marketing scientist should be able to help you with that. But it's, it's really important to do it. Transparency is another one. It's another important principle or practice. To maintain transparency in AI, um, you have to, again, team up with your marketing scientists, but also know that they, a lot of marketing scientists are very good at illustrating concepts. And they should be able to explain to you how it works, what went into the model, how it's making decisions, how they're ensuring that decisions are as accurate as possible. And then all of this involves humor, human oversight. A lot of companies have governance teams in these frameworks that I'm talking about to make sure that your models are aligned with ethical standards, that those audits will happen that all stakeholders are clear and understand how it all works and what risks we may have built into the system. And so that's not the fun part. That's the procedural part, the structural part, but it's important that it happens because there's a lot, there are a lot of risks and there's a lot of risks to our reputation. There's a lot of risks to making predictions that do not fit a new data set that we bring into the picture or, or just help us waste money, and we don't want to do that. So those are the key practices I would recommend for ensuring that our models make ethical and unbiased decisions. I love that. I mean, we we definitely don't want to waste money. That comes up in almost every conversation. But the notion of transparency, I, I think this is one that not everyone talks about as much as they should, but there are times where we're blindly trusting the tools that we use and the recommendations and some of the black box type terminology that gets thrown out a lot. What are some of the fundamental questions that us as marketers should ask to validate outputs and assumptions of AI or predictive models? It's interesting that you did call out transparency because I'm a huge believer in it. And there are a few questions that you can ask. And I'm going to teach you one question to ask. Marketers, pay attention. There's one question you can ask. And one, you're going to sound really smart, I promise. (laughs) Two, it's actually, it's a question that could summarize this entire conversation we're having. And the question is whether whether somebody's trying to sell you the new shiny tool of AI or whether your own data scientists or internal teams are building models. The question is, how do you watch out for overfitting? How do you address overfitting? 
or just say, hey, what's overfitting? <laughs> Explain to me overfitting. And thus, how can we avoid making that mistake? And that could sum everything. What we just talked about, the audits, the transparency, the governance, and it's going to make you sound smart. And what overfitting is basically when we typically, when the model we trained had some noise in the data set and it's learning based on the noise, not just on the actual data. And so we may try to apply it to a real case scenario and it's, it's not working. So, or it's working accurately. And if we don't have the right checks and balances in place, we may not even know. We may not even know that we're overfitting. So that the model's over, overfitting. So very, I think if you ask that one question, if they know how to answer the question, now you're having a conversation. If they don't know how to answer the question, <laughs> we have a problem. So things to look at are your, your data sources. Where does the data come from? Do you have enough data? Is it reliable? Is it representative? The data, you know, it's implied in there, right? The data diversity. You want to look at performance metrics. And basically, what? how are we going to measure the model's performance? Bias, fairness, we talked about that. And then there's scenario analysis. And again, if you ask about overfitting, you're going to get into a conversation about, about scenario analysis. How does your model perform under different scenarios? And can we stress the model? Can we introduce edge scenarios? And you know, how is the model going to perform? And then validating and testing. How do we validate? How, we, how do we test? What validations, validation methods are we going to use? The interesting thing is, you know, a couple of years ago, I decided that I wanted to learn about this and I joined the MIT six month program in machine learning. And what was very interesting was that the, the professors were very good illustrators. They were very good storytellers. And I had forgotten, I'd studied statistics, but I'd forgotten how visual it can be that a lot of the concept, a lot of the math, so to speak, is spatial, it's geometry. And so this is not just about the numbers. Good storytellers should be able to help you visualize what they're talking about and explain to you how they're going to do the scenario analysis, how they're going to They'll talk about things like regularization or early stopping of the model to avoid overfitting. And you can ask them, what does that mean? And they typically should be able to, to explain to you. So it's not all math. Anybody should learn how to explain it. It's going to be very important to learn how to explain it to stakeholders because they're going to be the ones paying for these resources. So they need to understand. They need to understand the risks. They need to understand the benefits. And I'm a huge proponent of, of marketers learning, be, become marketing scientists. I'm, I'm a believer in the future of marketing, the future of the profession, being more scientific than creative. And so these concepts are very important to understand and they're not hard, they're not complicated. And it all, if all else fails, just ask the question, tell me about how we're gonna avoid overfitting. <laughs> I think that's a great question. I'm going to write that one down. I mean, there are some things that I think many would be surprised about with any predictive model if they start to ask questions, because there are times where you assume that the data is updating all the time and that it's watching what's happening. And, you know, we've seen huge differences in some tools where it's updated every six months versus nightly, where to your point, I mean, it could be based on incorrect assumptions. And, you also hit on the notion of reliability. I'm curious when you think about data size and diversity, how does that impact the reliability of AI model outputs? I mean, it's a great question. So one of the things that, that data scientists do when they build these models, we think of them as a model, but in fact, you build models upon models. You use models to test models. You use models stacked upon models and different statistical methods to check the reliability of the outcome of, of the outputs. It's not just one, we think of it as a model, but it's algorithms upon algorithms and data scientists are gonna like send hate mail right now, but I'm trying to really <laughs> simplify this for, for marketers. And so again, if you open the conversation with the data scientists, they should be able to explain to you how, I'll explain it like this. 
it's because it's an interesting visualization. Those those of us who have started using ChatGPT, we know that we give inputs and in the, we stack the inputs. So we'll say, you know, please analyze this piece of content now. Give me the three top themes, whatever it may be, right? So one by one, we we give it inputs to get to the outcome that we're trying to get to. So a lot of times the models are built like that with the series of, of inputs that we need to create a system that with predictions that are as reliable as possible. Yeah, that's great. I would love to come back to transparency. It's one of my favorite words. And, you know, we talk about transparency, believability, explainability, all, all very similar concepts that we're trying to hit at here. But I'd love for you to talk about in what situations is it necessary for marketers to have visibility into the why behind AI recommendations? And, you know, the caveat to that which I would flag for many folks listening is there are plenty of AI recommendations that they're probably acting upon where they don't know the why, (laughs) but I'd love for you to hit on why that's so important and how we should start to think about that visibility. I think fundamentally these uh, models are, are tools and they cannot operate without human oversight. And so The human being in the loop is very important. And that's part of transparency. And in that, it's really important because ultimately the outcomes of that model affect humans, can affect humans. The classical example you will hear in school is the prediction of an illness and how you'd rather predict an illness and then you find out that, no, I don't have that illness then miss it and risk that that person's well-being. So high stakes decisions is one of the reasons why it's very important that we understand what's behind these recommendations. And that's important one. And other high stakes decisions are really important business decisions or things like loan approvals in our universe and financial services. And so You can't have a black box. You mentioned the the word black box. Now, black boxes right now are sexy because it feels futuristic. I don't know what's behind this. So it must be of the future. I must be in the future type of thing. But I find knowing sexier than not knowing. (laughs) So, (laughs) And it can help us avoid mistakes when it comes to high stake decisions. Obviously, there's compliance and regulatory considerations. Then bias detection, you know, I think in most cases we shouldn't avoid bias just because just for regulatory reasons. It's just good practice. And typically we can get better results, better make more money <laughs> if we actually avoid bias. Then there's trust. The this trust of the stakeholders into what we're doing, the trust of our customers. Again, go back to the example of, of a medical diagnosis, right? Your Patients need to be able to trust, so you need to be able to explain to them, you need to know the why behind that recommendation for them to be able to trust and believe that, oh, yes, I actually, there's no indicator of high likelihood indicators of cancer, whatever it may be. And then probably one of the most important ones is improving the model. So you have to be able to understand why a model is giving you the outputs it's given to be able to refine it to understand if you're missing an expansion of that data set, if you're missing scenarios that the model's not learning from. Because as you said, it has to evolve. You can't just update it once every two years. You definitely can't set it and forget it. Yeah, that was perfect. I think you nailed a t-shirt design there too. Knowing is sexier than not knowing. I mean, we're going to have that as a poll quote guaranteed. <laughs> that will be the social clip. I mean, that because it, it, it is so true. I mean, if we think about a lot of folks who are listening to this podcast, many of them are making decisions about which accounts sales should be targeting, and they may not really understand why those decisions are being made. So to your point, we need to understand that so we can have that conversation. And I know you hit on loan approval and some of the, the intricacies of financial services What are some of the practices or regulations that exist in different industries like financial services to make sure that 
we have fair, non-discriminatory use of AI? Yeah. So in financial services, there's a number of regulations to being Fair Credit Reporting Act and Equal Credit Opportunity Act. And both of those require that AI models used in lending and and credit decisions are fair and non-discriminatory. These acts have always required that. But basically what this is telling us is you can't have a black box. And for example, I'll give you a real life example where you could step into a black box and that's Facebook advertising, where the algorithm may make decisions for you and based on your limited, limited data set and show ads to a limited demographic. Now, Facebook has introduced these special categories, so that doesn't happen. And in those special categories, you can't target based on certain criteria. But from a regulatory perspective, we need to ensure that we understand how our models work and make sure that the decisions are fair and non-discriminatory. In healthcare, you have HIPAA, you know, that mandates also fair use of AI in medical decisions. And then in terms of general practices, I mean, I talked a little bit about the key practices earlier on, the diverse data sets, the ethical guidelines, the governance. There's this concept of, so, and by the way, I thought that the t-shirt that was going to be, you know, tell me about overfitting. I thought that was going (laughs) to be the t-shirt. But here's another catchphrase, algorithmic accountability. That's an important general practice. So we talked about transparency, algorithmic accountability. Bias mitigation, we talked about that earlier, and then, you know, ethics and guidelines. So a lot of that is governance, is structural. It's not the sexy stuff, but we got to do the not sexy stuff to get to the sexy stuff. And so my mind is blown all the time by how little attention we pay to that. And it's really tricky when we are being sold so many tools and systems under the label of AI. One, we haven't gotten to true AI yet. And two, most of the times we have no idea what's behind it. If it's even a solid machine learning algorithm or set of models. So it's very important to ask those questions and put the controls in place and then you can move faster. Yeah, I love that. And I mean, such an important point as we start to wrap here, I I just want to stress the point you just made. There are folks posting on LinkedIn every single day about various tools that are powered by AI that may be eliminating job functions. I mean, that it's that level of what people are saying when that's usually not the case. And we may not even understand everything that's happening. Well, when we think about the the modern evolution of technology and go back to the early 1900s where people were afraid that the new machines, the new equipment in factories were going to replace people. And when in fact it created jobs, it led to an industrial revolution. We're looking at something similar here. I don't think AI is going to replace people. I think it's keep creating the opportunity for more of us to specialize in new things. There's going to be more marketers who are going to learn about machine learning. And one thing I wanted to, we, earlier when we talked, we were talking about transparency and, and even overfitting. I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep bringing that up. I'm going to be a very happy person today when every marketer asks the overfitting question. But you know, I always think of this, what we're doing here or how to explain to marketers how these models and algorithms work is that imagine if if aliens tried to learn how humans speak and not just how we speak, but be able to predict how our language is going to evolve. And for that, they have to go back historically. They have to talk to a bunch of us, different languages, different accents, what you may have. It. And, and then it also, and so as part of that, I was also reminded how we all know those people who try to teach us a curse word in a language without telling us that it's a curse word. So the noise in the system that we need to avoid by using a good data set, a wide enough data set, a diverse enough data set, is to, if we were to build this to teach aliens, or the aliens were using this to teach how to speak and how to speak in the future, that noise can really affect how that model works. 
And so that's my default when I try to explain to people the importance of of the data that we feed in the system, the controls that we need in place, this transparency we need. It's like, you know, learning a brand new language, trying to go through the vocabulary, understand the grammar structure, all of that. And there's so much potential noise in there. And it takes so long to learn. And you meet new people who have different accents and who have their own ways of saying things. And you're learning again from them and you're expanding that data set. And it's this evolution of your knowledge of that language. And then some people go for PhDs and then use historical data and try and predict how language will change in the future. But that wraps in a lot of the concepts that we talked about today, the key practices, the data diversity, you know, the regular audits. When you learn the language, you may have to take some tests and show what you've learned, (laughs) that transparency and the ability to, you know, somebody should call you out if you try to teach me a curse word. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and so on. So it's truly not as much of a black box as many are trying to make us think. It's very comprehensible. We just have to go through the practice to be able to have that accessible visibility knowledge. And then we can put the, uh, the, ad- the models, the algorithms to work to speed up things for us. That's a great point and great example. And for those of us who have children, I mean, the language changes every few years. My 12-year-old says things that I have no idea what they mean. So to your point, I would not want that in an email. (laughs) We need to make sure we have that reliability and that good data set. We're coming up on time. There's two very quick questions we love to nail in a really short amount of time. The first is, who are the folks that are inspiring you in the B2B space that you recommend we bring to the show? Yeah. Jill Rowley, I think she was the chief something officer at Marketo at one point. John Miller. Sangram. Yep. Sangram at Go to Market Partners. Yeah. Yeah. In the content marketing EBM world, I would say Andrew Crestodina. I had to throw a, in a Chicago shout out there. Those are some of my favorites. Yeah, I love those. I've worked with a few of them. And Andy is one of the smartest folks I've ever met. So yes, great people there. And then the most important question, how can everyone get in touch with you after this episode? Well, I'm on LinkedIn and pretty much on every social network is Manamika, M-A-N-A-M-I-C-A. Every social network except TikTok. You can find me by that handle, including LinkedIn. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time today. It was a great episode. Really appreciate you joining. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for On Base. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to share, rate, review, and subscribe on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. The show is brought to you by DemandBase, the only account-based experience platform built for sales and marketing alignment. 